Mel Alvin. I'm the host and the founder of the Jazz Confusion Power Hour. My name Alex. is Dion Parson, and I'm honored to share my passion of music with you, our listening audience, through my cultural heritage. Things can change for you, too. If you want to be brand new, that is absolutely possible. Hello, everybody, and I want to welcome everybody to the Jazz Confusion Power Hour. I'm your host, Mel Alvin. And again, uh, just for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, um, the Power Hour is a show that is based on jazz and jazz crossover. And we bring some of the leading artists performing jazz and jazz crossover, um, jazz gospel, jazz country, jazz funk, jazz rock. Uh, anything that connects to jazz, um, we're into. Um, and you know, we've had a, a wonderful history of artists. We've had Annie Lennox, Billy Ocean, Brian Culbertson. We've had um, Eric Roberson. Um, we've had Kamasi Washington. I mean, I can go on and on. We've had a, a very great list of artists, and tonight is no exception. All right, and I want to tell you a little bit about um, who our special guest is tonight. Tonight's guest was named a genius on the guitar by the Los Angeles Times. His guitar playing is stellar. That's according to Jazz World. Take your pick, he's a good picker by Jazz Weekly. One of the greatest treasures as a guitarist by the famous Najee. A guitar player's guitarist by Critical Blast and a perfect blend of jazz, Latin, R&B and funk from the Atlanta Daily World. Tonight's artist is a guitarist, composer and producer. He has graced the stage and has recorded with people like Philip Bailey from Earth, Wind and Fire, Sheila E., Frank Stallone, the Alan Parsons Project, Bobby Womack, Carlos Santana who did with Womack. Um, uh, it was called, I think it will Save the Children, if I remember correctly. The Gap Band, Lakeside, Dynasty, Little Anthony, Ronnie Laws, Kiko Matsui, Najee, Warren Hill, Bill Champion from Chicago, Ellis Hall from Tower of Power, and many others. I mean, I think you're going to enjoy the music and enjoy the person. So please, welcome today to Aaron Blake. That's Blake Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I said Aaron Blake. I'm sorry. I apologize, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You're, you're not the first uh, to, uh, to get it backwards. But uh, thank you for having me, Mel. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Glad, glad you can make it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Blake, what I'd like to do, I'd like to start out by asking you, I do this with all the artists, to tell everybody what's cooking, what releases you have, you know, what's coming up, what, what you know, if you're going on tour, where, where might you be appearing? So I want to give everybody an overview about what to look forward to in 2024. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff happening in, in uh, 2024. Well, first of all, the the best news so far this year is just two days ago, uh, the current single called She's the One uh, went number one on Billboard. Uh, we also are in, uh, we actually swept four charts. So uh, Billboard, uh, Media Base, uh, Smooth Jazz Network, and Radio Wave. So uh, we're very happy about that. And uh, we're going to be uh, doing a lot of touring. I'm going to New York, um, where you're originally from, actually, yeah. next week. Um, so I'll be uh, actually, I think I'll be staying in Brooklyn. I think you said you're from Brooklyn. Yeah. I'll be staying in, in Brooklyn, playing out there. And we're gonna, I'm going to be going to uh, Houston and then out to Europe for a while. Uh, first time playing in London. So uh, we got a lot Great. of touring coming up. Um, I have a lot of artists that I'm producing, uh, new and talented artists this year. Uh, we are working on a Christmas album for this Christmas, uh, just releasing uh, the brand new cd called love and rhythm i just got those sent to me uh in the in the shipping uh so out of my front doorstep yesterday and uh, the actual release date is april 19th for that so got a lot of stuff going on wow that's you're a busy person do you, <laughs> do you, do you remember where you're going to be about what location in, in brooklyn where, you're uh, where i'm going to stay um i don't i'm just uh, okay. I had a people uh yeah but uh, if you have a recommendation, because I don't think it, we've actually booked the, the hotel yet, I'll, uh, I'm open <laughs> to recommendations. Yeah, where, where are you performing in, the, in Brooklyn? 
Uh, I'm actually not performing in Brooklyn. I'll be performing in Connecticut, but um, oh. I, I wanted to see some people in New York and I just, I haven't been in New York in a while. So gotcha. I can stay in Brooklyn and then just uh, take either the train or, or drive up to Connecticut. Terrific. Okay. Well, you know, look, again, I'm, I'm so glad to have you on the show and I, there's so much I wanted to talk to you about. So, you know, the first thing I want to tell you is, and this is something that I'm always curious about. I know that artists when they post on their social media and they post on their website, <clears throat> they want to explain what's current. And that's often what a lot of people want to see. But part of what this show is about is for your fans and new people who have not yet had the pleasure of hearing your music, they get to know something about you, the artist behind the music. So I like to start off looking, talking about something biographical, but as typical, there was very little biographical on the internet. So can you tell us a little bit about where you were born, your family, how you came to music in the first place? Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, I came from a somewhat musical family. It wasn't uh, a, a very musical, but my my dad played guitar. My brother played guitar, just kind of hobbyists. Uh, when I was uh, you know, a little kid, uh, three or four years old, I do remember my dad kind of singing us to sleep with uh, an acoustic guitar. Uh, my, when I was seven years old, my older brother was my first guitar teacher. So, uh, you know, but he just stayed knowing a few chords on the acoustic guitar. And then I you know, took it a, a lot further than that. So, uh, so I'll, that's probably at least what exposed me to music. My dad was really into a lot of different kinds of music. Uh, but what it was more back one generation, both of my grandfather's, uh, we're in the movie business. So as a matter of fact, they did a movie together called the, um, the Inv invasion USA. It was the original invasion USA back then a long time ago. And that was how my parents met was both of my grandfathers doing a movie together. Well, both of them worked with Nat King Cole. So, um, oh, wow. music was a huge part. As a matter of fact, they still have a, uh, uh, and you know what? I could even show it to you. Um, it is a money clip, uh, which I still treasure to this day from Nat King Cole to uh, my grandfather. Oh, cool. And Nat King Cole is still to this day one of my favorite artists yeah. ever. Um, and uh, so even though my my father and my mother, they weren't musical per se, my dad was actually an engineer of all things. Um it, it kind of still translated from uh, all of the music that was uh, kind of passed down through the family from the movies. So uh, I was exposed to everything, even from when I was a little kid, a lot of jazz, uh, a lot of rock, a lot of funk. There was no, um, there was no, there was only good music and bad music, you know, in my house, there was just all kinds of different music going on. And that's really what, happened to me throughout the rest of my career and what I took with me as I went in. So because of that, I have done stuff in all kinds of music, rock, and we'll, we can talk about that more later if you want, but rock and uh, jazz and funk and uh, all kinds of different things, mostly from my exposure to it from when I was uh, very young. Did you take lessons? I did take some lessons. A lot of it was self-taught, um, but I did take some lessons. Uh, uh, most of my education was kind of throwing myself into situations that I had no idea what I was doing. So I would jump <laughs> into the deep end of a pool and somehow learn how to swim, you know? So uh, for example, um, you know, I, I played a little bit of rock and roll and then I just decided I was going to go into my high school jazz band. I had no idea how to play any jazz, but I just did it. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at all these crazy chords going, I have no idea how to play this stuff. But somehow <laughs> I figured out how to, how to do it. And then I did the same thing when I was a junior in high school. Um, some of the uh, high school students were saying, well, you should audition for, even though you're still in high school, you should audition for a college jazz band. And I did, I did, I had, no idea what I was doing, but I actually auditioned for a college jazz band. Somehow I got in. I have no idea why. I was still wow. kind of a rocker at that at that point. And uh, so when I was a junior in high school, I was actually playing in college jazz bands. And then so I decided, well, maybe I, I should like learn this for real. So I actually 
went, I went to college for music when I was, you know, after I graduated high school, uh, I went to Cal State Long Beach and I majored in music there. And um, by that time, I had kind of taught myself a lot of stuff that had happened. So it was more about being there and being around all these other great musicians that I still play with to this day. As a matter of fact, um, Jeff, I don't know if you know Jeff Cashua, but Jeff Cashua and I mm -hmm. went to college together. Jeff Cashua is, is a great saxophonist, played with the Rippingtons for years. Oh, wow. OK. For the Rippingtons. And uh, we just did a, 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 a big um, show together in Las Vegas last year. So I still actually uh, uh, see some of my, my college buddies from, from that time. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great story. Did you learn to, to read uh, music when you went to, in college? Yeah, or could you read before? I, again, it was something that I had no idea really how to read. But by the time I got to... Uh, the, when I was a junior in high school and I was playing in the college jazz bands, yeah, I, my reading just had to get better. Otherwise I wouldn't, wouldn't survive. Yeah. <laughs> so it was pretty much trial by fire, you know, on, on all this stuff. And that's pretty much the story of my life. The same thing after I graduated uh, college and then I got into all these, uh, it was really just by chance, got into all these funk bands and, um, you know, I was kind of the, I was like the only white guy in these in these <laughs> bands, and um, you know, there's a certain sound to that that I mean, they for some reason I, I could play lead pretty well, but my rhythm was not, you know, mm -hmm. at that time you had to really have it in the pocket for the rhythm. And some of those rhythm guys are just so good, and yeah. um, at that time. I, I didn't know how to do it. Uh, and yet they were pretty patient with me and just said, man, you got to listen to some of this stuff and listen, listen to these rhythm players. And uh, I did. And I, by the time I ended up playing with, uh, you know, the Gap Band and the Funkadelics and Bobby Womack and all this stuff, I had it forced me to become like a really good funk and rhythm player. You know, I, I, if I followed your career quite a bit. And you're really known as a stylist. You know, you're that's why you get such rave reviews on your guitar work. Who did you try to emulate? Anybody? Oh yeah, lots of lots of people. So when I was a kid, <clears throat> you know, I yeah, I started as a rocker, as you can probably tell. Um, so I was, you know, I was really into like all those classic rock bands like Zeppelin and. Um, Aerosmith and Queen and Journey and um, Van Halen and all that stuff. I was really into those guys. So in the beginning, yeah, I was all about, I wanted to play like Eddie Van Halen or, or Jimmy Page or uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I kind of went backwards in time because um, the more I would study my current guys, people would take me aside and go, well, you know, if you like Eddie Van Halen, if you like Stevie Ray Vaughan, you really got to listen to Jimi Hendrix because that's who they got it from was Jimi Hendrix. And I went, really, I, you know, at that time, you know, I didn't know anything. I was like, I never heard of Jimi Hendrix because he was before <laughs> my time. So then I put all, all this Jimi Hendrix stuff on. I'm like, whoa, what's this? And so that opened up a whole new word, world for me. And then uh, even though I had jazz around the house, I, I didn't really dive deep into it until, um, it was kind of a slow process. Like the first guy I listened to that had a little bit of jazz in him was Jeff Beck, who was one of the yeah, yeah. premier rock guitar players, but he had a little bit of jazz going on yeah. in, in his playing. So that was, it was kind of this slow transition where I went, Whoa, I love Jeff Beck. And so I listened to that and they said, well, if you like Jeff Beck, then you got to check out Larry Carlton or Robin yeah. Ford or yeah. Pat Metheny or George Benson. And then it was just like all oh, these worlds started you know, opening up for me. And then they're like, well, if, if you like those guys, they all got it from West Montgomery, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. who's West Montgomery? Montgomery. <laughs> you know? So then, you know, I had to check him out. So it was like this backwards in time thing. And it's like, well, you know, you know, it's not just West Montgomery, you know, there's Charlie Parker, there's John Coltrane, there's, you know, there's Miles Davis. I mean, you get, and then again, more worlds just open. You mean there's like horn players doing all this stuff too. So, I mean, that was kind of my education was kind of starting in the current rock world and going back in time and having all these worlds open up for me. And that was kind of my education. 
you know, it's interesting because the ideology of, of music, who to what who and who do they teach, and, you know, how, how, how it comes forward. You know, when you get to people like Bruno Mars, you know, uh, for example, you know, uh, who samples so much from the 50s, 60s, oh, 70s, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and, you know, people that really understand the roots of the music have such an advantage over other people because they, they, just, they just have a wider repertoire of, of, of instrumentation. Right. And, you, you know, it's just, it's, it's, there's, no, there's no replacing the history, you know, right. understanding yeah. where it all came from. The best guys have always very admittedly said, you know what, I owe my whole career and playing to these few guys. And, and I can say that too. I mean, I owe who I am to uh, I'm, I'm sure i'm forgetting some people but definitely you know jeff beck and hendrix and george benson and Matheny is a huge one for me um and west west montgomery and 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 horn players too uh miles davis and coltrane and and I'm sure uh, alan parsons was in there too alan parsons yeah, yeah. yeah. alan parsons what, what an amazing yeah. What an amazing guy that is. I mean, just he's just a production genius, that guy. Yeah, yeah, totally amazing. You know, I mean, I'm so glad you're you're telling this to people because for young artists who, you know, you know, I don't want to get into a, a political kind of conversation with you tonight sure. about this, but, you know, a lot of the contemporary urban music, it's all looping. There's no instrumentation. Right. Um, to me, it's boring, but sure. you know, and that's just me. And I'm not saying the music is bad. I'm not really. I'm just talking about me. But um, you know, the, the richness of you know having a string section or horn section, you know, and you know having a, a percussion section that's more than just drums, and you know, and orchestration is is just to me, it's what music is about, and jazz adds improvisation to all of that. Yeah, it yeah. does, and, and 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 what more so than rock or country or your you know it it just it's so improvisational, which makes it just such a unique form of music. Yeah, you know, absolutely. we're going to talk a little bit about this because we're going to talk about smooth jazz and some of the evolution from straight ahead jazz to smooth jazz. We'll, we'll get to that too. But I'm glad yeah. people are getting to hear young musicians how important knowing the roots of music really is to become a better musician. Absolutely. That's what I teach my students uh, in the classroom in college or my private students or whatever. It's it's sometimes when kids are first learning, uh, one of their first concerns is, and they've expressed this to me, is that, well, but I don't want to just copy people. I want to be yeah. me, right? And it's like, you can be you, but you can't learn in a vacuum. You have to, it's like, don't worry, the, the you part of it will come. So because no one is going to have the exact same combination of players that they like as you do. And no one's going to digest that information, if you will, the same way. So no one is going to, you know, I've, I've transcribed so many solos from the, the people that I admire. And, but no one is going to digest... Um, you know, a, a Hendrix solo and a West Montgomery solo and a Eddie Van Halen solo and a, and a Charlie Parker solo in the same way and put them all together and go, well, if they can do this, I can do that and take the next step. And then it, it will come out, you know, that person. You know, I think it was Miles Davis that said, when you look at a song and you see notes, the notes that don't tell you anything about the music. It's how loud you play it, how long you hold it. Absolutely. You know, I, I mean, he said it's it's, and that's what makes you you, as opposed to anybody else. You're looking at the same music. It's the space in between the notes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, or you know, um, no, no. Uh, well, I forgot who said it. I think it was God, was it Philly Joe Jones who said everything you need to know about music, everything you need to learn about music is in your living room. And what he meant by that was. You know, back in that day, everyone had an actual record collection in their <laughs> room. Yeah. And the way that those guys learned, a lot of those guys, they didn't go to school. They they actually had record albums that they would sit down and transcribe it. 
they would write it down or they would just figure out what is this guy doing and that everything. And it, it is really true. If you can figure out by ear, everything that is going on in, in these records, everything you need to know about music really is in your yeah. living room. Yeah. You know, you mentioned space. Eric Clapton once said most important music, most important part of any song is space. A hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. It's no, it's knowing when not to play. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you know, this is why I wanted to have you on because you know I, I want to, I just want so our viewers and musicians that are tuning in to really start to understand, you know, the the, the breadth and depth, the, the experience and time. You know, a lot of people think when you go up on the stage, you know, like all you do is you get up and play, and they don't, they have no clue you know, on how long it took you to get to that one song, you know, what you had to do and sure. prepare and go through, you know, yeah. just for that one song, you know, you're not just yeah. getting up and playing. It's not how it works. <laughs> right. Right. You yeah. Know? That's a hundred percent. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just all the years of sweat and, and your heart and your passion and study yeah. and all that hopefully that's my goal for it to come out in, in my music. You know, so that's, that's the, I think that's to me, that's success. If you can represent um, your uh, music and in, in, in that all the passion, all the work, all the sweat, all the, all your experiences that you went through in life. If you can have that, come out through your music if, if that can be evident through your music and in in a somewhat commercial way that is accessible uh uh to people then you've that's it that's success uh that brings me when you talk about commercial it brings me to the next <clears throat> topic i wanted to talk about how you got to smooth jazz right and you know, and you know i know you don't like being typecast just as a smooth jazz musician and you you know, you've entered funk and r&b to me smooth jazz is kind of pop and r&b blended together and i'm not so sure where it's jazz roots are anymore but i wanted to talk to you about that you know sure. how did you come to smooth jazz and how have you evolved as a musician within that genre if you can call it a genre <laughs> sure <laughs> i mean yeah i mean we kind of prefer to call it contemporary jazz because smooth has kind of become a, a, a kind of a dirty word <laughs> and, yeah. uh, uh, but um you know yeah i mean it basically is, is exactly what but by the way they used to call it fusion i don't know if you remember that but they used yes. to call it fusion, yes. where it was um literally rock and jazz fused together yes. so you know back in in one of the first examples of that is uh, Miles Davis with Bitches Brew. That was one of the first fusion albums yeah. ever. And it's really, it, by the way, he, <laughs> Miles, not to get too, too sidetracked, but Miles Davis really kind of started a few genres. He started the whole cool jazz era. He started the whole okay. fusion era. He started the whole, I mean, you could say he had a lot to do with starting the whole bebop era. I was just so, going to say that too, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and, and another, per, excuse me, another person who sits in here is Grover Washington Jr. Uh, absolutely. He was one of the fathers of, of what you would, might call smooth jazz. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean, smooth jazz did start out with... <laughs> Uh, hard to say. I mean, it's yes, it was jazz. It was made a little bit more commercial, but I think that um, in its purest form in its best form really came from fusion. And in a way that fusion started out with being a uh, melting of jazz and rock, but then uh, smooth jazz is a little bit more R and B based where a lot of us who have played R&B and funk over the years and who love playing R&B and funk like me and who also love playing jazz, that is the perfect way to combine the two. So we still have, I, I know what you're saying as far as, you know, boy, is there any of that jazz still left in, um, uh, and the, the way I would say that, yes, there is some elements of jazz left is in some of the chord progressions and the improvisation. Mm -hmm. There's not, as much room for improvisation as there were as there was in say miles davis's day you know you listen to um kind of blue 
And, you know, 80% of that album is improvisation. Whereas in smooth jazz, um, you know, uh, it's more like 20, 25% is, is improvisation. But there is a, kind of a, one of the guys that really made me understand that, that that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing is Pat Metheny. Because if you listen to Pat Metheny's stuff, he does a ton with just the melody before he even starts to solo. It's, it's, like a, it's like you're watching a movie. So it's like I realized it doesn't always have to be like it was in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s where you play the head or the melody of a song for two minutes and then you blow a solo for 20 minutes. It doesn't have to be that. It can be, um, it can be like Matheny did it, where you actually grow this whole movie, if you will, in a song, and then you take a solo. So I tried to learn a little bit from that and go, okay, how can I do this in smooth jazz where I'm actually developing uh, a composition almost like I, I do actually try to picture my music visually like a movie and uh, and then try to, and then, and then of course incorporate as much improvisation as I can. So you're right. There's not as much of that as there used to be, but the, some of that element is still there. Thank goodness. And yeah. uh, that's that's what I uh, appreciate that that is still there. Some of you know, I know some of my couple, some of my friends, Curtis Harmon and James Lloyd from Pieces of a Dream. Curtis, yeah. has, uh, Curtis has been on, and we've had this discussion also. And they've always been very funky, you know, at, as a oh, yeah. You know, yeah. And and they you know they they came on board with Grover Washington. He he took them when they were in high school on tour, you know. So they but so they represent that fusion period a lot in their music so you can find the improvisation you can find a lot of that a lot of that funk and a lot of that rock and within, within the context of their smooth jazz and there is a lot of improvisation so i think it varies like you said when you look at Matheny, you look at from artist to artist there's going to be so many interpretations of what the word smooth really is anymore sure sure yeah yeah, yeah we, we have a we have somebody who's Looking in and enjoying your commentary, Eloise Rachel. Thank you. She said, "Great show." Oh, hi, Eloise. <laughs> so, um, well, look. What, what I'd like to do now is to turn to um, to talk a little bit about the successes you've had. You know, given the fact that you're so multi-genre, you've had quite a number of top one and top ten Billboard and media base hits. You want to talk a little bit about those for everybody and let them know some of the accomplishments that you've had and you know it was on, on charting on billboard and charting other places oh sure thanks um yeah it was it, it was a tough process uh where it you definitely couldn't give up and and fortunately i've always had a very persistent uh, nature because i've been putting out um records since the early 2000s and we didn't have our first number one until Groovers and Shakers, which was 2018. That was our first number one. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. I take that back. We did have a number one with Encantadora. Uh, with, that was the one that featured uh, uh, Najee. And then Groovers and Shakers was our second one. But there was a long time between Encantadora and Groovers and Shakers. And then finally, everything just seemed to, uh, to open up. And we've had a total of seven now since two days ago since then uh as a solo artist and i've also had three as a producer so a total of 10 now uh so after uh groovers and shakers uh we had um i think the next one was fall for you and that's still my most successful song to date uh that has uh, six, i love that oh thanks uh six million streams on on spotify and uh for some reason that's is just the one that really uh, resonates with people and uh, you know, you just never know what's going to uh, resonate with people and what's, you know, uh, we've had great success with a lot of them, but for, there's something special about fall for you that seems to resonate with the uh, people. And then we had, um, let's see, Sunday strut. Uh, that was with Najee as well. Yeah. That, uh, that went number one dreamland went number one. Um, our latest one is She's the One that went number one. Oh, and then I did uh, Feel So Right with uh, uh, with Greg Manning, and that went number one as well. Well, we, let's start off with one of your songs for everybody if they can hear it. 
So let's start off with season one. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about the background and then we'll play that one first. She's the one actually was something I heard a guru from my friend, Adam Holly. Um, it was just a, like a chorus groove with a, no melody or anything. Uh, and that apparently, uh, that he did with Carnell Harrell, which is a great keyboard player. I work with. Yes, all the time. Yes. And there's just something, there's been a few songs and you're, you're asking me before about how I write songs. Yeah. Most of my songs are melody first. But sometimes it goes the other way around. Sometimes I'll just hear a progression and I'll write something. That happened with Groovers and Shakers. Darren Ron sent me like this, this really cool groove and it, it immediately inspired me. I wrote the melody for Groovers and Shakers and the other sections literally in 10 minutes. And that's the same thing that happened with She's the One. As soon as I heard that, I sat down and I just thought of that chorus melody and it just came to me instantly. And then I wrote the other sections. And after I wrote it, I called adam up and said um i hope you don't mind but i took this groove and i wrote a song and uh let's do it together and uh he and he loved that idea and uh uh and, and here it is it's, uh, she's the one <laughs> well like I, this, I, this is a wonderful track and congratulations on another number one well thank you you know i, I mean the hits keep coming <laughs> Yeah, so, fortunately, yes, and uh, hopefully they won't uh, they won't stop anytime soon. Wonderful. Okay, this is Blake Aaron. She's the one.
that's a great track from Blake. It's really fabulous. You know, it, oh, your, thank te you. your technique is so is great. You know, one of the things I just want to leave this cover art up for a second because I want to talk oh, about so many you. different things with you. But the cover art, who's doing your artwork? It's beautiful. Oh, thanks. You're not going to believe this, but that is actually the first time we've done cover art with AI. That's AI, that, that cover art. Now that you is. have to sit there and you, you've got to design it with AI, but that is uh, AI. All my other cover art has been, uh, you know, actually manually done. Let's uh, put it that way. Right. But yeah, this is the first one we tried with uh, AI. I had a certain, uh, I actually had this vision uh, for this to be just like this, you know, more like a beat scene and guitar and romantic and, uh, you know, someone who looks a, a somewhat close to my wife. Um, and uh, so uh, that's, that's a wise uh, move. We just <laughs> <laughs> manipulated that in, uh, in AI. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's terrific. You know, it really looks good. Are you hearing me? Okay. You did cut out there for a little bit. Okay. How about now? My back? Yeah, now you're fine. Okay, great. I just want to make sure. Well, you know, one of the things I want to yeah. talk about a little is technique. And, you know, it's so timing is so important playing behind the note, in front of the note, you know, grace yeah. notes, grace notes. Why don't you tell people a little bit about your technique? Yeah, you you nailed it. I mean, it's just same thing I tell my students. It's uh, and what you said earlier, it's not just the notes. It's not just the notes. It's how you're playing the notes. When you listen to these guys, don't just transcribe what they're doing. How are they doing it? So yeah, you're 100% right. Um with this kind of music, jazz and R&B, funk, all this stuff, it's really playing slightly behind the beat. Um, not to where you're dragging what the way I explain to my students actually is it's like one of those old shooting galleries. Uh, you ever been to Disneyland? They have the shooting galleries, the ducks going by. Yeah. 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 So yeah. picture that the ducks going by is the beats that you want to hit. Okay. So whenever you have a beat that goes by, that's the pocket of the beat, the duck. So you can hit the duck in the head Okay, if you hit the duck in the head, that's like you're on top of the beat. Right. Okay. If you hit the uh, and that can work actually for some styles of music, like with with Latin music. Sometimes it's nice to be a little bit on not rushing, but a little bit on top of the beat. And we're just talking milliseconds here. You can hit the body of the duck. In other words, you let just a fraction of a second more go by, and you hit the body of the duck, and that's just that's more like rock stuff where you just want to be just like a, almost like a sequence or like a computer right on some of the, depending on what kind of rock stuff. Um, and then the funk and the R and B stuff is like, you want to hit the tail of yeah, the duck yeah, yeah. a little bit more laid back on that stuff. But however you look at it, don't miss the duck. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> so, you know, what you're so, talking about. Oh, go ahead. You know, no, I was going to say what you're talking about is milliseconds. And that is the training. That yep. uh, you know uh, to develop that kind of understanding of technique, it takes years to master. It doesn't just come it right. Does. It yeah. does. Yeah. Well, well thank you. I'm glad. Down. I'm glad. I'm glad you talked a little bit about that because I want people to understand, you know, what goes into, a, you know, a simple chord progression. You know, in, in, into you know how you into breaks. You know, in, in the music and key changes and. You know, it, it just requires so much concentration and so much work to be able to play jazz at that level. It's just not easy. It does. And then, you know, you want to kind of combine that with uh, uh, at a show. I mean, at the same time, you have to kind of go out in the audience. And you have to relate to them and you, yeah. you can't. Yeah. It's so easy for all of us to, um, you know, <laughs> Miles Davis is another great example of that as brilliant of a musician as he was the thing that people did not like about miles davis was he turned his back to the audience yes, he really yes. didn't care <laughs> yeah. about relating to the audience i mean I, one of the foremost geniuses of our time was miles davis but yet he was not good at relating to the audience he turned his back to the audience and people didn't like that so 
and that's so important that you relate to the audience. So to do both of those at the same time, to have virtuosity, to have the groove and relate to the audience at the same time, it's a challenge. You know, Chuck Berry was once asked, you know, how do you decide what songs that the audience wants to hear? And he said, I don't care what they want to hear. He said, I want them to hear something they didn't know they wanted to hear. <laughs> right, right. So, so, yeah. so, so he would take them on, you know, he would play what he wants them to hear, you know, something they didn't expect him to do. And, and, and I guess sure. that's what, that, it's those different ways that you meet your audience. It doesn't have to always be on their terms. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and on, you know, on my shows, I try and go out into the audience. I try and keep the energy up. I mean, there's people are moving around. We're, you know, we don't have any like choreographed steps or anything, but, you know, we're trying to kind of dance a little bit and, you know, get to get yeah. things going because it's just so important that the audience um, feels that energy, not just musically, but, yeah. you know, yeah. that there's a smile on your face, that you're making eye contact. All those things are important. Look, it's ent it's entertainment. <laughs> That's what it is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. So, let's, I want to I want to turn to something different. You had a radio show for seven years with and with Tina Anderson. Yeah. So why don't you tell everybody yeah. about how that happened and who Tina Anderson is? Well, wow, it's another story. Um, so I live um just south of LA and um there's a rate or was a radio station down here called KSBR. And they're just like 10 minutes from my house. And they were a great radio station. They're still there, but they changed formats. And they played jazz for, wow, uh, over, over 20 years. I think it was even 30 years. And they would ask me to come down a lot because I lived so close. And they enjoyed interviewing me, I guess. And so I probably did about four or five interviews uh, in person, live. And... Um, they came up to me and said, you know, you've done this so many times. You probably should just do your own radio show here. I went, really? Uh, and they said, yeah, we, we think that you'd be good uh, as a host. And I said, well, you know, it's funny you say that because I've always thought about doing a live music radio show where people come in and do music unplugged. In other words, I've got an acoustic guitar um, maybe me, me and a saxophone player, me and a vocalist or whatever. And we actually just sit down like we're in a living room and we talk about music and then we play live on the air. And there's just something, you know, a little different when it's musician to musician uh, asking about, you know, what's happening behind the scenes kind of thing. So um, I tried that and it seemed to work really well. And then we ended up we had so much, just like you, we had so many different guests and not just jazz guests. We had um, Kenny Loggins on the show. We had John Anderson from Yes. Uh, we had, you know, Boney James and Peter White and Brian Culbertson and Keiko Matsui and, uh, oh boy, you name it. We had just about uh, everyone on the show and they all came in and played live music, just unplugged, just two or three instruments. Uh, one time we even had the whole band from Hiroshima in there. But uh, Jim Kumamoto had uh, it was, everything was just acoustic uh, and playing sax, and you know the drummer was on a, a, a cajon, and uh, it was great. It was great. We always did live music, and that was syndicated for a while. We were in London as well. Uh, we were in Europe. Uh, we were all over the country for a while, but after a while, it was just um, it was kind of taking up so much time that it was preventing me from doing what I wanted to do in my own career. So after a while, I just, as much as I loved it, I kind of had to uh, let it go. Yeah. The, the, only, the only thing I, I, I still am curious about is, you know, who, who, who was your co-host Kira Anderson? How did you meet her? Oh, Tina. Tina. Yeah. yeah Tina. I'm sorry. That's a, so what they said is, um, you know, the, the radio station was actually out of a college um, called Saddleback College down here. And um, they said, but you have to take a radio class. We don't let anybody do a radio show here that doesn't have some kind of education in radio. So I said, okay. So I actually went to, uh, to college 
for radio <laughs> and learned about radio and learned about, you know, whatever, how they marketed and the whole thing about uh, radio. And Tina was my professor. <laughs> uh. So, so she, uh, she, she was my first professor. And then Terry Waddell, who ran the, the station was my second professor. And so, you know, she found out that I was doing the show and I said, you want to come down and be my guest? And she ended up being my co-host after that and, and a good friend as well. But That's she was fabulous. my first professor. And she actually dropped me on the first, uh, she didn't know, <laughs> she dropped me on the first uh, class meeting. And I'm trying to remember why. Um, I think um, <laughs> I think I was at a, at a show or something. I wasn't able to come to the first class. And so I got this notice saying, uh, Tina Anderson uh, uh, dropped you from uh, <laughs> your radio class. And I still give her a hard time about that, that uh, I had to actually petition to get back into the class. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, you got you got even. You made her work with you. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Right now, you're stuck being my co-host. I'll, I'll say exactly. Right. Look, if we were talking about transitions into radio, let's talk about another transition. All right, um, TV. Let's talk about television. TV. And yeah. I guess Mad TV. Mad TV was your first gig. No, actually. No? Um, no, that's uh, that was probably uh, third or fourth. Oh, boy, that's another story. I just seem to just run into stuff uh, in yeah. my life and that I'm never prepared for, and it just kind of just kind of happens. Um, so back a while ago, there was this thing called Musicians Contact Service, and you would, um, you know, the internet was there, but still, it was people going in. Uh, the best way to get gigs was to actually go into the office, fill out an old fashioned piece of paper, put an old fashioned picture up there, submit a CD, that kind of thing. That was still kind of the best and most effective way uh, to do it back then. So I did that. I drove up to Hollywood and um, I was submitting all my stuff. And then I heard in the background uh, this other group of people and they were talking about making a music video and needing a guitar player and and they were well who should we get well let's look at this guy let's get, look at that guy and i'm usually not someone who just walks up to people and just goes you know hey hire me but uh i just thought you know what what do i have to lose so i walked up and i just said uh, you know i sorry i couldn't help overhearing you're looking for a guitar player um you know my name is blake aaron and uh, if i would love to submit some of my stuff and uh they looked at it and they said wow no this is great and uh we're looking for a guitar player to be part of this music video and you have the kind of look that we're looking for and we'll give you a call so they gave me a call and they said we want you to be part of this music video so I did that and it was absolutely awful. <laughs> um, it was this singer that they were putting all kinds of money behind. And I don't even know why she was not that good, but they had me do this solo. And I did this whole like MTV style, you know, big old hair video with hair going all over the place and big, big guitar solo and everything. And the video did everything pretty much absolutely nothing but the guy who did the video was best friends with an up-and-coming film and tv composer who wanted to uh submit uh a song for a cop show he's a keyboard player and it was supposed to be more guitar oriented for this cop show and so he said i don't have a guitar player to work with so he's you know we just did a video with this guy and he was great so this guy called me up. His name was Greg O'Connor. And he said, you don't know me, but I got your name. Uh, I don't even remember who the referring guy was anymore, his name. And uh, would you like to come over and we can write the theme for a cop show together? Wow. And I, sure. Why not? So I came over. We wrote a song together. Um, and um, what's funny is it didn't get picked up by the cop show, but we got picked up by a show later on. So it never flew, but then, uh, you know, you think, okay, well, that's the end of the road for that one. He ended up getting the gig for a show called the Ben Stiller show. Right. Uh, right. And uh, he became the composer for that show and he needed 
the guitar. He gave me a call. So I ended up being the guitar player on the Ben Stiller show. Uh, that turned into a show called Sunday Night Comics. And those producers were the producers that ended up being the producers for Mad TV. Uh, so Mad wow, TV okay. hired right. Greg and they hired me to be the guitar player. And I, I ended up being the guitar player on Mad TV for 15 years. And then from wow. there, uh, I did uh, all these movies like that Steven Seagal movie and uh, a bunch of other TV shows from there. Wow. I mean, you've got such great stories. And, you know, and so much of this it really is serendipitous. You know, I mean, it, it, but, you're, you know, you always yeah. have to be in the you have to be in the right place at the right time. It's really <laughs> the timing. Timing is everything. Do. You do. Yeah. And yeah. That, that Woody Allen quote is so true. 80% of success is showing up. Showing up. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely right. Let's yeah. play another one of your songs. I want to I want to play Crush. You know, why don't you tell everybody a little bit okay. about that and, and then we'll go, we'll play fresh for everybody. Okay. Uh, similar to uh, She's the One. Uh, that was another one that um, I heard a groove from uh, Adam Holly. And uh, again, immediately inspired me to write that melody over that. And then uh, he and I actually got uh, together in person because a lot of people write over the internet now. We just thought, you know, let's do this old school and actually sit in the same studio together and uh, uh, not leave until we've got a couple of hit songs. So we actually wrote Crush and I think it was Big Bounce and the same uh, same day. Uh, and those became uh, two uh, singles and Crush, uh, uh, Crush did really, really well on Apple Music. Wonderful. Okay, let's everybody listen to, this is Blake Aaron, Crush.
that's wonderful, Blake. What a great oh, track. Thank you, Mel. We have a comment from Jack McDaniel saying, love the groove. You crushed it. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, look, you know, we're starting to run out of time, so I'm going to play some more of your music. So, okay. You know, all right, is that all right with you? So we're going to yeah. kind of move ahead and, you know, bring out another song. And I think the next song we want to play is Dreamland. You okay. Want to quickly, you want to quickly set up Dreamland for everybody? Sure. Uh, let's see. That's, uh, once again, that was with my friend Adam Holly, And uh, uh, we, uh, that was the one that uh, we got together in the studio. And uh, uh, that was uh, more of, me writing the groove and him writing the melody on this one. I think I wrote the verses and uh, so a little bit of a switch on that one. And, uh, but another great collaboration between Adam and I. Wonderful. You know, I love your artwork. Your, the, the cover art is great. Oh, thanks. It reminds yeah. me of going back into the 1970s when they used to have record albums and every, it was really a contest for who had the best cover art in the other, on the record album. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. This most of the artwork is my, you know, weird imagination. So that, <laughs> I thought it's this great. Would, it would be cool if, uh, like, I was climbing up a, la a ladder and there, you know, one city scene that was daytime, one city scene was nighttime, and all this stuff. And then my graphic artist was like, "You want to do what?" <laughs> I, I, it's great, and and the, the fact that the city is inverted too makes it interesting. Right, right. So let, let's let's play Dreamland for everybody. By Aaron, okay. This is by Blake Aaron Dreamland.
just love the music, Blake. It's just, oh, you know, it's, you, Mel. It's, it's such a great evening. I've been enjoying this so much. You know, we're really running out of time, and I want to be able to play Groovers and Shakers. But before we do that, I do have one question for you. Sure. Where is Blake Aaron going to be five years from now? You've done so many different things. Do you have any idea? Like, you know, like Eric Clapton recently has been playing jazz with Wynton Marsalis. You know, yeah. and Billy, Billy Joel took a turn trying to write classical music. What do you see yourself five years from now? Well, I hope I'm still doing a little bit of the same thing as far as do, just maybe doing uh, bigger and better concerts. I'd like to do a little bit more and more international stuff. Uh, I am going to be going to Europe uh, this year playing uh, uh, Pizza Express. I'm going to Amsterdam, but I would like to expand that. Um, I have, uh, I, for some reason, they're playing Groovers and Shakers twice a day in Bangkok, Thailand, for some crazy reason. Uh, so, um, and my brother used to live out there, coincidentally. So uh, we're trying to break into Asia, pr uh, playing out in uh, Korea and uh, in Thailand. And so I would like to do more international stuff. And then, yeah, maybe do some more collaboration uh, like, like you were talking about earlier. It would be great to collaborate with some of my heroes. I mean, I would just love to one of these days collaborate with somebody like Sting or uh, uh, yeah. that would be like a, a dream yeah. because yeah, some, somebody like that would be that would be a dream come true. You, you, should, you should catch somebody who's on my show early on, Billy Ocean. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, Billy's great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he was yeah. in the show. Yeah, yeah. I had Annie Lennox on here. I've had a lot of oh, interesting. I love uh Annie Lennox's version uh, of uh what's that cover that she did recently? Just so great. Uh she's she's amazing. Yeah, she did a song that was almost baroque called Cold. You ever have you ever heard yes, Cold? I have. It, it is just unbelievable. Yes. You know, you know, and, and I've had I've had on to Macy Gray and and Oh, you know, and, she's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. She, I mean, these are people that can take a song and do things with it. You'd never expect. You right. Know? Right. And so it makes the, it makes them so unique. Okay. Let's tell me a little bit about Groovers and Shakers and. Uh, uh, another what? similar story. I was actually um, at that time trying to work with uh, Darren Ron for a long, long time. Really loved his playing and uh, heard a lot of great things about him. And uh, we never were able to quite get our schedules together. And uh, so uh, finally, he just sent me this track out of the blue. I was It was right before July 4th, and uh, my family was ready to go out to the beach. And out of the blue, I got this track. And when I say a track, it means it's just kind of a groove with a drum beat and some chords, no melody or anything. And uh, he said, what do you think of this? And I wasn't expecting him to say that. Oh, this is great. I got a chance to work with uh, Darren Ron. And again, I heard this and it was one of those songs I wrote. Not every song works this way, but Groovers and Chickers was one of them I wrote in 10 minutes because, and my wow. family was actually in the car waiting for me and they were calling me, why are you coming down? I said, one second, well, let me just record this real quick before I forget it. And I took down that guitar um, and that ended up actually being the guitar on the track was the guitar that I quickly recorded while my uh, my wife and kids were going, are you coming down? Well, here's a 10-minute song <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> composed in 10 minutes by Blake Aaron called Groovers and Shakers. <laughs>
Waco. That's fabulous. You know, I've learned something listening to your music again tonight. You know, you were a master of breaks and key changes. I mean, oh, the, the timing is so impeccable. You know, I mean, oh, thanks, Bill. No, it's just it, it's unusual. I mean, to, to see it, you know, see it come out that way. Huh? Look, this has been wonderful. I, there's so much more I want to share with everybody about you, um, but we're out of time. And I hope you'll come back in the future and sure. spend more time with us again. Absolutely. It's, been a, it's been a real pleasure. And I, I, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to be on the Power Hour. Of course. Thank you, Mel. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care.